listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Joy you unboot now, ladies and gentlemen. Joy you unboot now to another edition of the Corbett Reports Film Literature and the New World Order series, that podcast series where I, your host, James Corbett, examine various books and movies for their deeper significance. And this time on the podcast, we're going to be talking about And Then There Were None by Eric Frank Russell, a short story first published in June of 1951 in Astounding Science Fiction magazine and later developed into the novel The Great Explosion, published in 1962, but we will be talking about the 1951 short story. And as always, there will be a link to the online version of that short story that you can read in HTML or PDF form, Uh, and it's all there for free viewing up on simpleliberty.org, so that link will be there. But also this time, we have an extra special treat. Uh, I managed to acquire the services of John Lothe, who some of you might know as an audiobook reader. He wrote, uh, he read the audiobook version of previous Corbett Report guest Vin Armani's self-ownership book and a number of other audiobooks that are available online. Uh, and he has uh, read this uh, short story into the record. So if you would prefer to hear a version of this, he did an excellent reading um, that is available for free download. Uh, it's up on the actual show notes for this page. So just go to corporatereport.com and it will be in the Film Literature New World Order section. You will be able to find the show notes for this podcast and it will contain a link to download that MP3 audio file, uh, which I suggest you do. I think it's a very good reading and uh, I, I don't know about you, but I personally very much appreciate audiobook formats, especially well-done readings like this one because it really does help uh, to pass away the time when you're doing dishes or driving around or whatever it is that you do in your daily routine. Having said all of that, let's get into an examination of this work of science fiction, and we'll start by talking briefly about the biography of Eric Frank Russell, who is not really a household name and not even a name that looms largely in the pantheon of science fiction, although perhaps that's uh, an omission that needs to be corrected, as certain other uh, panelists on science fiction um, panels and things that I've seen have uh, noted he was an excellent writer, just doesn't seem to get very much credit for his uh, stories. So there's very scant uh, biographical details uh, of Eric Frank Russell up online, and I was really only able to find one biography of any significance up on a uh, rather obscure website, so I'll include that uh, link in the show notes uh, as well to this podcast. But long story short, Eric Frank Russell was born on January 6th of 1905 in Sandhurst in Surrey, England, and his father was a royal engineer and instructed at a military academy in Sandhurst, and like most military families, uh, Russell's moved around a good deal, and part of his youth was spent in Egypt and Sudan. A uh, fact which is rela- rela- uh, reflected in some of his stories, most notably in Homo Saps. Um, but uh, after some more scant biographical details, we do get this nugget in a short biography which was published in the 1963 Penguin edition of Three to Conquer. He, Eric Frank Russell, described himself as follows. I'm six foot two inches tall with gray-brown hair, green eyes, and look as if I should have been hanged at Nuremberg. My best friend is Professor Frederick B. Schroyer of California, also a writer. My best enemy was the late Alistair Crowley, whom I put in his grave by (laughs) bone-pointing. Very intriguing. And even more intriguing, perhaps, uh, it turns out in his later years, he gave up writing for reasons unknown to his friends in the publishing world. So that's the somewhat mysterious life of... Uh, Eric Frank Russell, and as I say, he did uh, publish uh, some material that uh, that people in the know uh, think are good examples of science fiction, so I will point you to that, and the 1962 novel that was developed out of this 1951 short story, The Great Explosion, did go on 23 years after it was published to win the Prometheus Hall of Fame award, so he did uh, attain some credit and some notoriety, but just not, uh, he did not become a household name. But that's uh, perhaps to the detriment of all of us, because at any rate, I have not, I will confess, I have not read any of his other work, but I have read this short story, and I think it is a very insightful little short story. I think the good kind of uh, science fiction that is not exactly subtle in the way uh, we are meant to read this as an allegory for our world and what can and should be, Um, but 
nonetheless, I think is insightful, instructive, and uh, acts as an interesting little thought experiment. And as you'll know uh, from having read or listened to the short story, the thought experiment that is put before us revolves around the idea of an imperial ambassador and an uh, imperial uh, crew of the Terran Empire reaching out to establish diplomatic contact with a a far-flung colony, long-lost colony of obviously former Terrans, but now uh, colonizers of a foreign distant world uh, that call themselves the Gans. And unfortunately for the Imperial ambassador and his crew, things do not go so well in their attempt to establish contact with the Gans via the infamous and well-known uh, cliche, the science fiction cliche of take us to your leader. His Excellency gazed into the distance, doing it with pride of ownership. Looks like there's someone plowing over there. He's using a little engine between a pair of fat wheels. They can't be so backward. Hmm. He rubbed a couple of chins. Bring him here. We'll have a talk, find out where it's best to get started. Very well. Captain Grader turned to Colonel Shelton, boss of the troops. His Excellency wishes to speak to that farmer. He pointed to the faraway figure. The farmer, said Shelton to Major Ham. His Excellency wants him at once. Bring that farmer here, Ham ordered Lieutenant Deacon. Quickly. Go get that farmer, Deacon told Sergeant Major Bidworthy, and uh, hurry, His Excellency is waiting. The Sergeant Major, a big, purple-faced man, sought around for a lesser rank, and remembered that they were all cleaning ship and not smoking. He, it seemed, was elected. Tramping across four fields and coming within hailing distance of his objective, he performed a precise military halt and released a barracks square bellow of, Hi! You! He waved urgently. The farmer stopped, wiped his forehead, and looked around. His manner suggested that the mountainous bulk of the battleship was a mirage, such as a a five-a-penny around these parts. Bidworthy waved again, making it an authoritative summons. The farmer calmly waved back, and got on with his plowing. Sergeant Major Bidworthy employed an expletive which, when its flames had died out, meant, Dear me, and marched fifty paces nearer. He could now see that the other was bushy-browed and leather-faced. Hi! Stopping the plow again, the farmer leaned on a shaft and picked his teeth. Struck by the notion that perhaps... During the last three centuries, the old earth language had been dropped in favor of some other lingo. Bidworthy asked, Can you understand me? Can any person understand another? Inquired the farmer with clear diction. He turned to resume his task. Bidworthy was afflicted with a moment of confusion. Recovering, he informed hurriedly, His Excellency, the the Earth Ambassador, wishes to speak with you at once. So? The other eyed him speculatively. How come that he is excellent? He is a person of considerable importance, said Bidworthy, unable to decide whether the other was being funny at his expense, or, alternatively, was what is known as a character. A good many of these isolated planet scratchers like to think of themselves as Characters of considerable importance, echoed the farmer, narrowing his eyes at the horizon. He appeared to be trying to grasp an alien concept. After a while, he inquired, What will happen to your home world when this person dies? Nothing, Bidworthy admitted. It will roll on as usual. Of course. Then, declared the farmer flatly, He cannot be important. With that, his little engine went chuff-chuff, and the wheels rolled forward, and the plow plowed. 
Digging his nails into the palms of his hands, Bidworthy spent half a minute gathering oxygen before he said in hoarse tones, I cannot return without at least a message for his excellency. Indeed? The other was incredulous. What is to stop you? Then, noting the alarming increase in Bidworthy's color, he added with compassion, Oh, well, you may tell him that I said... He paused while he thought it over. God bless you and goodbye. Now, as you know, the first act of this story really revolves around this central confusion on the part of the inhabitants of this world as to what it is these strange beings from Terra are really after at all. Who is this excellency that you want us to talk to, and why do you want us to talk to him, and who are you looking for to talk to him exactly? A big wig? Why do you want someone with a big wig to talk to this person that you call his excellency? And this immediately brings forth the fundamental question of language, and may perhaps they just don't understand our words. Maybe they have a word for the chief or the person in charge, the leader, the bigwig, the head honcho, the grand mufti, whatever you want to call it. Maybe we just don't know the right word for it. So they are attempting to communicate with people that they uh, assume have fundamentally the same mindset. And I think one of the things that this story draws out quite effectively is a very important idea that, like so much else, can be completely lost because it is right there in front of our face. And like fish swimming in water have no concept of water, I think we have very little appreciation for how much of our reality and even the possibilities that we have in the political sphere or any other is, if not determined, at least restricted or limited by our language for even describing or understanding certain notions. In a world, if there was a world, where the even the concept of a leader and following a leader and having a single central grand mufti or someone to negotiate on behalf of a geographical location, if that concept doesn't exist, well, yeah, how do you take someone to your leader? <laughs> what does that mean? Why? Who do you want to talk to and why? Uh, it, it becomes a literal impossibility for that request to be fulfilled, which is an intriguing part of this uh, drama. And I think the, the, the story does gesture to that fundamental role that language plays in our formation of reality on several occasions where, for example, the Gans point out some of the interesting words that the Terrans take so for granted that they don't even really understand the use of. Uh, for example, the word uniform, as one of the characters points out during the story, is, well, you know that means, all alike. That's what it means. And Harrison, uh, engineer Harrison with his bicycle, is forced to admit he'd never really thought of that before. Well, yeah, I guess that is what it means. Or the word cooperation, as it is pointed out, is, uh, it doesn't mean what we generally think it means, it means basically that you will obey what someone is saying. <laughs> um, at the end of the day, that's what a lot of people would call cooperation anyway. Whereas, of course, if if we were trying to define cooperation, well, of course, that means that you're you're doing something with someone, that, that there's some sort of negotiation happening there and you're agreeing on something. But that isn't necessarily what's meant in a lot of cases. In fact, it is just obedience. He is being obedient. He is cooperating. It is interesting when you start dissecting some of these words that we use that we don't really contemplate in great detail. But of course, the, one of the central parts of this, the way this language plays out in the discrepancy between the viewpoints of the Terrans and the Gans, is in this word, myob. Whatever that means. What is myob? Why do they keep saying myob to us? And of course, the great reveal, ultimately, Harrison discovers that it is initial slang for M-Y-O-B, mind your own business, which is a refrain that the Terrans hear an awful lot from the Gans, because that is one of the fundamental cornerstones of their viewpoint, their way of looking at the world. It's none of your business. Why are you trying to tell me what to do? Why do you care what I'm doing? Mind your own business, my ob. And that isn't just a, uh, a peripheral part of this story. I think that goes to the heart of the weapon, the weapon that it is revealed, the Gans have developed, that can be used against the Terrans, but that the Terrans cannot use against the Gans. What? What kind of weapon is that? How could there exist such a weapon? 
Gleed leaned on the counter and gazed absently at a large can of pork. Seeing I'm out of uniform and not on parade, I sympathize with you, though I still shouldn't say it. I wouldn't care to be taken over body and soul by other world bureaucrats myself. But you folk are going to have a tough time beating us off. That's the way it is. Not with what we've got, Jeff opined. He seemed mighty self-confident. Huh, you ain't got so much, scoffed Gleed, more in friendly criticism than open contempt. He turned to Harrison. Have they? It wouldn't appear so, ventured Harrison. Don't go by appearances, Jeff advised. We've more than you'd care to guess at. Such as what? Well, just for a start, we've got the mightiest weapon ever thought up by mind of men. We're Gans, see? So we don't need ships and guns and such like playthings. We've got something better. It's effective. There's no defense against it. Mm, I'd like to see it, Glee challenged. Data on a new and exceptionally powerful weapon should be a good deal more valuable than the mayor's address. Greater might be sufficiently overcome by the importance thereof to increase the tick to 5,000 credits. With a touch of sarcasm, he added. But, of course, I can't expect you to give away secrets. There's nothing secret about it, said Jeff, very surprisingly. You can have it for free any time you want. Any gand would give it to you for the asking. Like to know why? You bet. Because it works one way only. We can use it against you, but you can't use it against us. There's no such thing. There's no weapon inventable which the other guy can't employ once he gets his hands on it and knows how to operate it. You sure? Positive, said Gleed with no hesitation whatever. I've been in the Space Service troops for twenty years, and you can't fiddle around that long without learning all about weapons, from string bows to H-bombs. You're trying to kid me, and it won't work. A one-way weapon is impossible. Don't argue with him, Harrison suggested to Baines. He'll never be convinced until he's shown. I can see that. Jeff Baines's face creased in a slow grin. I told you that you could have our wonder weapon for the asking. Why don't you ask? All right, I'm asking. Gleed put it without much enthusiasm. A weapon that would be presented on request, without even the necessity of first planting a minor arm, couldn't be so mighty after all. His imaginary five thousand credits shrank to five, thence to none. Hand it over, and let me try it. Swiveling heavily on his stool, Jeff reached to the wall, removed a small, shiny plaque from its hook, and passed it across the counter. You may keep it, he informed, and much good may it do you. Gleed examined it, turning it over and over between his fingers. It was nothing more than an oblong strip of substance resembling ivory. One side was polished and bare. The other bore three letters, deeply engraved in bold style. F. I. W. Glancing up, his features puzzled, he said, Call this a weapon? Certainly. Then I don't get it. He passed the plaque to Harrison. Do you? No. Harrison had a good look at it and spoke to Baines. What does this F-I-W mean? Initial slang, informed Baines. Made correct by common usage, it has become a worldwide motto. You'll see it all over the place, if you haven't noticed it already. 
I have spotted it here and there, but attached no importance to it, and thought nothing of it. I remember now. I've seen it scribed in several places, including Seth's and the fire depot. It was on the sides of that bus we couldn't empty, added Gleed. Didn't mean anything to me. It means plenty, said Jeff. Freedom. I won't. That kills me, Glee told him. I'm stone dead already. I've dropped in my tracks. He watched Harrison thoughtfully pocketing the plaque. A bit of abracadabra. What a weapon. Ignorance is bliss, remarked Baines, strangely certain of himself. Especially when you don't know that what you're playing with is the safety catch of something that goes bang. All right, challenged Gleed, taking him up on that. Tell us how it works. I won't. The grin reappeared. Baines seemed highly satisfied about something. That's a fat lot of help, Gleed felt let down, especially over those momentarily hoped-for credits. You boast about a one-way weapon, toss across a slip of stuff with three letters on it, and then go dumb. Any guy can talk out the back of his neck. How about backing up your talk? I won't, said Baines, his grin becoming broader than ever. He favored the onlooking Harrison with a fat, significant wink. It made something spark vividly inside Harrison's mind. His jaw dropped. He took the plaque from his pocket and stared at it as if seeing it for the first time. Give it me back, requested Baines, watching him. Replacing it in his pocket, Harrison said very firmly, I won't. Baines chuckled. <laughs> Some folks catch on quicker than others. Resenting that remark, Gleed held his hand out to Harrison. Let's have another look at that thing. I won't, said Harrison, meeting him eye for eye. Hey, that's not the way. Gleed's protesting voice died out. He stood there a moment, his optics slightly glassy, while his brain performed several loops. Then... In hushed tones, he said, Good grief. Precisely, approved Baines. Grief, and plenty of it. You were a bit slow on the uptake. Overcome by the flood of insubordinate ideas now pouring upon him, Gleed said hoarsely to Harrison, oh, oh, Come on, let's get out of here. I, I, I gotta think. I gotta think someplace quiet. Yes, the ultimate weapon, the one that can be used by the underclass or the oppressed against their overclass and cannot be used against them. Freedom, I won't. And there is, for students of philosophy, something of the Hegelian master-slave dialectic in here. But I think more obviously, and again, we don't have to dig very deep for this analogy since it is spelled out explicitly in the story, this relates to Gandhian nonviolent resistance. Of course, the Gans take their name from Gandhi, and this is the uh, the precedent, the historical, the world historical precedent from which they are acting, which I suppose must be many, many centuries in their past in whatever time frame this story is set in, but at any rate, you do get the idea, and I think it is developed and elaborated and presented in that wonderful, remarkable way that you can do in literature, in fiction, that uh, presents these ideas in a way that uh, we haven't thought of them before. So here it is, the ultimate weapon, and of course it isn't long before the mind virus of freedom I won't infects not only Gleed, but some of the other crewmen of this imperial uh, 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 diplomatic mission. And in the end, of course, it's Large-scale, quote-unquote, mutiny? Well, as one of the characters in the story says, mutiny, don't be childish. Uh, you get to decide. You get to decide if you will or will not do something. That's freedom, isn't it? 
that is the fu- a fundamental point uh, of this story, and it is demonstrated beautifully and effectively. At a certain point, uh, yes, of course, if one or two people are disobedient and fall out of line, they can be brought back into line or thrown in the brig or whatever needs to be done. But if the people who are there to throw these people in the brig or uh, inflict whatever punishment is going to be inflicted, if they refuse to comply, well, then the pr- people above them will have to do it. And if the people above them refuse to comply, then who is going to do it until eventually you get the imp- Imperial ambassador himself, forced to be the jailer of all the people who won't listen to his orders, which becomes a downright absurdity. And this plays out in the logic of the story, I think, quite well, and we see how this works. And it is a devastatingly effective technique when it is practiced on a large scale as quite obviously with the world historical precedent of the formation of the modern Indian state from the ashes of the old British Empire, uh, the brought down by Gandhi and non-violence, or at least that's part of the story, and obviously there's much more to flesh out there, but I think the, uh, the idea, the philosophy of this is intriguing, and as I say, I think the story fleshes that out in an interesting way, although... Although it is not really elaborated on in the story and it does not reappear, I think the essence or the seeds of what is used, or one of the, the prime techniques that the, the overclass, the powers that should not be, whatever you want to call them, use in trying to deflate or, or uh, undermine this nonviolent resistance, one of their techniques is, in fact, alluded to quite directly in the story. Your Excellency, I don't think we need to exercise our minds over new plans for making contact and gaining essential information. It looks as if the next move is going to be imposed upon us. How do you mean? There are a good many old-timers in my crew. Space lawyers, every one of them. He tapped the book. They know official space regulations as well as I do. Sometimes I think they know too much. And so... Grader opened the book. Regulation 127 says that on a hostile world, a crew serves on a war footing until back in space. On a non-hostile world, they serve on a peace footing. What of it? Regulations 131A says that on a peace footing, the crew with the exception of a minimum number required to keep the vessel's essential services in trim, is entitled to land leave immediately after unloading of cargo, or within 72 Earth hours of arrival, whichever period is the shorter. He glanced up. By midday, the men will be all set for land leave and itching to go. There will be ructions if they don't get it. Will there now, said the ambassador, smiling lopsidedly. What if I say this world is hostile? That'll pin their ears back, won't it? Impassively consulting his book, Grader came back with, Regulation 148 says that a hostile world is defined as any planet that systematically opposes Empire citizens by force. He turned the next page. For the purpose of these regulations, force is defined as any course of action calculated to inflict physical injury, whether or not said action succeeds in its intent. I don't agree. The ambassador registered a deep frown. A world can be psychologically hostile without resorting to force. We've an example right here. It isn't a friendly world. There are no friendly worlds within the meaning of space regulations. Greater informed. Every planet falls into one of two classifications, hostile or non-hostile. He tapped the hard leather cover. It's all in the book. We would be prize fools to let a mere book boss us around, or allow the crew to boss us either. Throw it out of the port, stick it into the disintegrator, get rid of it any way you like, and forget it. Begging your pardon, Your Excellency, but I can't do that. Greater opened the tome at the beginning. Basic regulations 1A, 1B, and 1C include the following, whether in space or on land, 
A vessel's personnel remain under direct command of its captain or his nominee, who will be guided entirely by space regulations and will be responsible only to the space committee situated upon Terra. The same applies to all troops, officials, and civilian passengers aboard a space-traversing vessel, whether in flight or grounded, regardless of rank or authority. They are subordinate to the captain or his nominee. A nominee is defined as a ship's officer performing the duties of an immediate superior when the latter is incapacitated or absent. All that means you are king of your castle, said the ambassador, none too pleased. If we don't like it, we must get off the ship. With the greatest respect to yourself, I must agree that that is the position. I cannot help it. Regulations are regulations, and the men know it. Grader dumped the book, poked it away from him. Ten to one, the men will wait to midday, pressing their pants, creaming their hair, and so forth. They will then make approach to me, in proper manner, to which I cannot object. They will request the first mate to submit their leave roster for my approval. He gave a deep sigh. The worst I could do would be to quibble about certain names on the roster and switch a few men around. But I couldn't refuse leave to a full quota. Liberty to paint the town red might be a good thing after all, suggested Colonel Shelton, not averse to doing some painting himself. A dump like this wakes up when the fleet's in port. We ought to get contacts by the dozens. That's what we want, isn't it? We want to pin down this planet's leaders, the ambassador pointed out. I can't see them powdering their faces, putting on their best hats, and rushing out to invite the Yoo-Hoo from a bunch of hungry sailors. His plump features quirked. We have got to find the needles in the haystack. That job won't be done by a gang of ratings on the rampage. Greater put in. I'm inclined to agree with you, Your Excellency, but we'll have to take a chance on it. If the men want to go out, the circumstances deprive me of power to prevent them. Only one thing can give me the power. And what is that? Evidence enabling me to define this world as hostile, within the meaning of space regulations. Well, can't we arrange that somehow? Without waiting for a reply, the ambassador continued. Every crew has its incurable troublemaker. Find yours, give him a double shot of Venusian cognac, tell him he's been granted immediate leave, but you doubt whether he'll enjoy it, because these Gans view us as reasons why people dig up the drains. Then push him out of the lock. When he comes back with a black eye and a boastful story about the other fellow's condition, declare this world hostile. He waved an expressive hand. And there you are. Physical violence, all according to the book. Ah, yes, the ambassador and his crew are bound by their own regulations and the bureaucracy which rules over them, and as they are all obedient to cooperators in the hierarchical structure of the Terran Empire, they are duty-bound to give all of their officers leave. And the only way to get around that is to designate the world a hostile one. But these are not hostile, violent people. They are not systematically using force to oppose the Terran Empire. So by the letters of the book, you have to declare it a peaceful world and you have to give the crewmen leave. But, hmm, well, what if we send in a provocateur? Yes, provocateurs to make nonviolent resistance into violent resistance, or at least perceived violent resistance, perceived so that it can then be used as a justification to declare someone a hostile entity and then take the appropriate legal, all within the letters of the law, actions to subdue that violent hostility. Uh, well, as they immediately go on to say, well, you can't, uh, by the 
letters of the law and the regulation, you can't interpret individual acts of violence as uh, systematic force and use that to rule an entire world hostile. So they're still, uh, they're still in that bind until they realize that perhaps sending the people on leave to try to recruit uh, or to get someone to get some more information might be a good idea anyway. But that idea of provocateuring some reaction out of the nonviolent resistors to make them at least seem like they are violent and hostile and initiating force is, of course, what is used and is a very effective tool to this very day. I've talked about it many times, and of course I recently talked about it on the podcast, talking about various provocateur events. As, for example, at the SPP protests in 2007, I've talked about it many times over the years, but there it is, that's the example of it. They send police dressed as protesters into the crowd, bearing rocks, going menacingly towards the police line to try to initiate something so that then the police can crack down on all those violent protesters. Oh, look, you saw them. They had rocks in their hands. When it turns out, of course, no, those were not protesters. Those were undercover police. And if they hadn't have been discovered, all of that would have been some crazy conspiracy theory. But because they were discovered and documented on film, the Sûreté uh, de Quebec eventually had to come out and say, yes, they were undercover police, but we were just monitoring. So that is provocateuring, and that is how it works, and that is, it is, unfortunately, still a devastatingly effective technique, because most people refuse to believe that provocateur techniques could ever be used by our wonderful authorities. They would never do something like that, so they will simply believe when they see these non-violent resistors suddenly turn violent and hostile and start attacking the police. Oh, it's anarchy. They're they're creating chaos. They just want violence. We, what are we going to do about it? Oh, we must crack down on them. So, of course, that is one of the tricks up the sleeve of the establishment in trying to maintain the status quo in the face of nonviolent resistance, in the face of this ultimate weapon, freedom, I won't. Another intriguing thing that is uh, explored in this story is the economic system, the monetary system of uh, the Gandians. And in fact, uh, it, it's not even a monetary system. In fact, it's explicitly referred to as the, by the ambassador as a non-monetary economic system. And that's what it is. Uh, it really harkens back, and I'm I have no idea if Russell was even vaguely aware of this, but I, I assume he must have had some familiarity with the centuries now of economic treatises by various economists who have opined on the, the birth of the monetary system as we know it, and it always goes back to some mythical, magical time in which people were bartering and swapping shells and swapping a, a cow for a, a, a shoe, a horseshoe or something, or sh swapping my bread for your your uh, wheat or whatever it is. Uh, and that was the basis for the monetary system before then suddenly someone had the idea, well, how about if we all recognize this piece of silver as valuable and we can use the silver to trade between each other? And that is the story that has been told over and over and over by various economists over the centuries. Um, with the seemingly nary one of those economists actually stopping to ask, well, is this historically accurate? Do we have a record that this really is how the monetary system came into view? It was everyone was bartering until they realized it was too it was just too laborious and and, and hard to do swaps and direct barter. So we'll use this uh, monetary uh, instrument as a way of smoothing over things. Did anyone actually stop to say, well, is that what actually happened? And it turns out the, from the latest archaeological evidence, that is, in fact, not the, the actual origins of the monetary paradigm that we have today. In fact, the earliest forms of money were debt, were obligations, uh, were promises, essentially, that, oh, okay, you, you give me this and I'll pay you back in some form some other time. And that was the way that early communities functioned. The, from the historical record, the best evidence that we have, and of course, you can turn to uh, David Graeber's work Debt. The first 5,000 years for more of the actual scholarly evidence uh, for that. So that is important. And really, whether he knew it or not, that was what Eric Frank Russell was gesturing towards with this non-monetary economic system that the Gans work with. And it's, uh, it's quite brilliantly presented. I, again, I think it's presented in a simple way that's easy to understand when you see it from this foreign perspective on this on this other planet, in this other time, so we don't have to think of it in our world situation, but we can see how it operates on, on the planets that the Gans inhabit. All right, let's have it. 
What have you come here for? Uh, I've been trying to tell you all along. I've been sent to... Been sent? Jeff's eyes widened a little. Mean to say you actually let yourself be sinned. Harrison gaped at him. Of course. Why not? Oh, I get it now, said Jeff Baines, his puzzled features suddenly clearing. You confuse me with the queer way you talk. You mean you planted an arb on someone? Desperately, Harrison said, uh, what's an arb? He doesn't know, commented Jeff Baines, looking prayerfully at the ceiling. He doesn't even know that. He gave out a resigned sigh. Ugh. You hungry by any chance? Going on that way. Okay. I could tell you what an ob is, but I'll do something better. I'll show you. Heaving himself off the stool, he waddled to a door at back. Don't know why I should bother to try to educate a uniform. It's just that I'm bored. Come on, follow me. Obediently, Harrison went behind the counter, paused to give his bicycle a reassuring nod, and trailed the other through a passage and into a yard. Jeff Baines pointed to a stack of cases. Canned goods. He indicated an adjacent store. Bust them open and pile the stuff in there. Stack the empties outside. Please yourself whether you do it or not. That's freedom, isn't it? He lumbered back into the shop. Left by himself, Harrison scratched his ears and thought it over. Somewhere, he felt, there was an obscure sort of gag. A candidate named Harrison was being tempted to qualify for his sucker certificate. But if the play was beneficial to its organizer, it might be worth learning, because the trick could then be passed on. One must speculate in order to accumulate. So he dealt with the cases as required. It took him twenty minutes of brisk work, after which he returned to the shop. Now, explained Baines, you've done something for me. That means you've planted an arm on me. I don't thank you for what you've done. There's no need to. All I have to do is get rid of the arb. Arb. Obligation. Why use a long word when a short one is good enough? An obligation is an arb. I shift it this way. Seth Warburton, next door but one has got half a dozen of my arbs saddled on him. So I get rid of mine, to you, and relieve him of one of his, to me, by sending you around for a meal. He scribbled briefly on a slip of paper. Give him this. Harrison stared at it. In casual scrawl it read, Feed this bum, Jeff Baines. Obligations? Well, that's a non-monetary economic paradigm that is so basic, so simplistic, that it couldn't possibly work. Except that it does, for the Gans. And this is a point that is explicitly brought up and cogitated on by the Imperial Ambassador and his cohorts on the battleship, thinking about, well, what does this mean? How can... they? they, they, they must, they're just backwards. They're centuries behind. They must need motorization, so to speak, of their old technologies. They, they need uh, to be updated, and they're just embarrassed about their old, backwards ways of living. Well, it does work for the Gans, and the Gans are perfectly happy with their system. And of course, that comes with a number of caveats. And one of them that is explicitly stated multiple times throughout the story is that this is a world where there are no large cities, where uh, people live uh, crowded together, millions of people who don't know each other at all. These are, this is a world of small towns where uh, people live in communities where they actually know each other, and thus there is some reputational element to their transactions with other people. They, of course, do not allow strangers to plant obs on them, uh, or strangers that they don't trust in some manner or respect. So this is a trust-based economic system, 
And it has some interesting implications. And we see that elaborated, for example, when Harrison goes to the fire de- depot to look for the fire chief. Who? Who's that? And uh, talks to the fireman, one of the firemen there, about, well, how do you earn your living? And he talks about the the uh, obs that the various stores uh, pay to the fire or plant on the fire or, or planted by the fire depot on the various stores as a type of fire insurance. And then whichever firemen go to respond to this or that call, get to... Uh, a crew more obs, um, but they have to kill off some of their own first, and all of that. It's it's an interesting system, and it's elaborated on in quite an interesting way here. Um, but of course, this raises the other question: Well, in a world or a society in which everything is trust based and everything is uh, surrounding these obligations, it's a a, a form of debt based system, I suppose. Well, then what do we do about the problem of shifters and freeloaders and people who just uh, plant obs on others but never kill them off. Well, of course, that is, again, addressed, addressed specifically in the story through the, the children's story for the Gans of Idle Jack. This world runs on some strange system of swapping obligations. How will any person kill an ob unless he recognizes his duty to do so? Duty has nothing to do with it, said Seth. And if it did happen to be a matter of duty, every man would recognize it for himself. It would be outrageous impertinence for anyone else to remind him, unthinkable to anyone to order him. Some guys must make an easy living, interjected Gleed. There's nothing to stop them that I can see. He studied Seth briefly before he continued. How can you cope with a citizen who has no conscience? Easy as pie. Alyssa suggested. Tell them the story of Idle Jack. It's a kid's yarn, explained Seth. All children here know it by heart. It's a classic fable, like, uh, like... He screwed up his face. I've lost track of the Terran tales the first comers brought with him. Red Riding Hood, offered Harrison. Yes, Seth seized on it gratefully. Something like that one, a, a nursery story. He licked his lips and began. This idle Jack came from Terra as a baby, grew up in our world, studied our economic system, and thought he'd be mighty smart. Uh, He decided to become a scratcher. What's a scratcher? inquired Gleed. One who lives by taking arms and does nothing about killing them or planting any of his own. One who accepts everything that's going and gives nothing in return. I get it. I've known one or two like that in my time. Up to age 16, Jack got away with it. He was a kid, see. All kids tend to scratch to a certain extent. And we expect it and allow for it. After 16, he was soon in the soup. How? Urged Harrison, more interested than he was willing to show. He went around the town gathering obs by the armful. Meals? clothes, and all sorts for the mere asking. It's not a big town. There are no big ones on this planet. They're just small enough for everyone to know everyone, and everyone does plenty of gabbing. Within three or four months, the entire town knew Jack was a determined scratcher. Go on, said Harrison, getting impatient. Everything dried up, said Seth. Wherever Jack went, people gave him the I won't. That's freedom, isn't it? He got no meals, no clothes, no entertainment, no company, nothing. Soon, he became terribly hungry, busted into someone's larder one night, gave himself the first square meal in a week. What did they do about that? Nothing. Not a thing. That would encourage him some, wouldn't it? How could it? Seth asked with a thin smile. It did him no good. Next day, his belly was empty again. He had to repeat the performance, and the next day, and the next. People became leery, locked up their stuff, kept watch on it. It became harder and harder. It became so unbearably hard that it was soon a lot easier to leave the town and try another. So, Idle Jack went away. To do the same again, Harrison suggested. With the same results for the same reasons retorted Seth. On he went, to a third town, a fourth, 
a fifth, a twentieth. He was stubborn enough to be witless. He was getting by, Harrison observed. Taking all at the mere cost of moving around. No, he wasn't. Our towns are small, like I said, and folk do plenty of visiting from one to another. In town number two, Jack had to risk being seen and talked about by someone from town number one. As he went on, it got a whole lot worse. In the twentieth, he had to take a chance on Gabby visitors from any of the previous nineteen. Seth leaned forward and said with emphasis, He never got to town number twenty-eight. No. He lasted two weeks in number twenty-five, eight days in number twenty-six, one day in twenty-seven. That was almost the end. What did he do then? Took to the open country. Tried to live on roots and wild berries. Then he disappeared. Until one day some walkers found him swinging from a tree. The body was emaciated and clad in rags. Loneliness and self-neglect had killed him. That was Idle Jack, the Scratcher. He wasn't twenty years old. On Terra, informed Gleed, we don't hang people merely for being lazy. Neither do we, said Seth. We leave them free to go hang themselves. He eyed them shrewdly and went on. But don't let it worry you. Nobody has been driven to such drastic measures in my lifetime. Leastways, not that I've heard about. People honor their robs as a matter of economic necessity, and not from any sense of duty. Nobody gives orders. Nobody pushes anyone around. But there's a kind of compulsion built into the circumstances of this planet's way of living. People play square, or they suffer. Nobody enjoys suffering. Not even a numbskull. Now, although obviously Eric Frank Russell writing this in the 1950s could not possibly have been writing explicitly about this, but we have seen in recent decades the development of marketplaces that are uh, that es essentially function in this way, not with a central authority that regulates each and every transaction in the marketplace, but by a sort of self-policing that arises from reputation. And I'm thinking sp explicitly of something like eBay, or perhaps more controversially, the Silk Road, where there is a reputa reputation-based system uh, where sellers and buyers interact and buyers can read feedback about sellers. And if you are you know, stepping into the marketplace and you want to buy something from someone, you can roll the dice and take your chances on someone who has zero feedback, who's never transacted before, or someone who has a very, very poor rating. And you can take your chance and hope that you will receive what you order. Or you can go with a seller who's established, who has a reputation, who has hundreds or thousands of uh, five-star ratings and feedback and very little of people saying they've been scammed uh, and trust that you're going to get what you pay for. And that is a system that functions without or can function to, the, to a large extent. There will always be exceptions to that rule. And it's not to say that no one will ever be scammed, but to say that there are ways that communities can help to organically weed out the shiftless or the, uh, the, the the vagrants or the people who aren't going to contribute to the community. Or, of course, the other side of this, and something I want to stress, although it is alluded to in the story, I think it's important to stress that freedom to say I won't or freedom to not interact with someone like uh, Idle Jack is also freedom to say I will. It is also freedom to interact with Idle Jack, to, to give Idle Jack your whatever, your the shirt off your back or whatever you want to out of charity or alms or sympathy or whatever it is. And I think that would be the other extremely important point of any or part of any community that comes together along the lines that, we're being, that are being portrayed in this story. It is also... I would imagine these communities would not just exist of these prickly people who say my ob to each other and don't cooperate in any in any way with anyone. Uh, it would obviously a system like this would function when there are people who are willing to do things for other people. And yes, that that urge to do things for other people might just be a cynical 
ploy to increase your own reputation so that at some point in the future, if you fall on hard times, the community will help to take care of you because you helped to take care of them in the past. I mean, maybe that's what philanthropy is on underneath. It's all ego based at the bottom or whatever you want to, however you want to frame that. But whatever the case may be, freedom to say no is also freedom to say yes. Freedom to not cooperate is also freedom to cooperate. Freedom to not give something of yours is also freedom to give something of yours. And I think communities that have people who display basic, I think, human urge for cooperation, for community, for coming together, that that expression would be a fundamental part of any free society. And I think the other important thing to stress about what we're being presented here is that, of course, as I've said before on the questions for Corbett and other things that I've done, if I had the magical switch to switch us over from the status society that we're living in right now to a anarchical society overnight, just flip that switch and all of the states go away, I wouldn't flip that switch right now. I would not do that because we have been indoctrinated, not only our entire lives and our parents' entire lives and our grandparents, but umpteen generations have been indoctrinated into the system that we are living in today. And if you flip that switch overnight, A, the rules of the game suddenly being changed will uh, obviously accrue in the favor of whoever is at the top of the pile at this precise moment in time, which uh, it does not lead to justice. But secondarily, also, because people have been indoctrinated into the system as it exists, they it will descend into the type of chaos that people associate with that dreaded word of anarchism. So I think uh, the point that this story is making is in the framework of this, well, here is this other planet where everybody is on the same page and everybody know, understands this philosophy of, of nonviolent resistance and what it means to cooperate and why they should cooperate with other people, but why they don't have to and obligations and all of this. This is, a, this is an ideology, but it's part of this big parcel, this package that comes and has to be understood in its totality, which is exactly why it's very effective in the framework of this story. The Gans can convert many of the Terrans, not all of them, but many of the crew members end up defecting, mutinying, uh, mutineering, and leaving the ship because they realize, well, actually, this is the type of world I want to live in. It's the ideology I want, which is why I think the one of the important points of this is it's about intentional community. There can be an intentional community of people who understand this philosophy and are prepared to live it with whatever hardships that entails as well and draw people into it. It's about being the change that you want to see in the world. And perhaps that sounds like a familiar refrain because a lot of these concepts discussed in this story should be familiar in one form or another. But I, I very much appreciate the way that Russell draws these things together in this science fiction story that, again, uh, gets past many of the the psychological guards and defenses that we would have if someone was laying this out as a, well, a potential society could do this and could do that, and it could work that way. Uh, we obviously have our intellectual guard up when it's presented in that non-fictional way, but when presented in a piece of fiction, you can see how a society might work, and it's the show them, not tell them idea uh, at play. So, uh, I, I, again, I hope that you did read through the story. At, at any rate, I hope you do read through it because I think there's a lot to tease out from it and a lot of different threads uh, that this discussion uh, will reveal. And uh, on that note, I'm going to leave it there. And of course, I'm interested in your discussion of this short story. And I will also leave you with the homework for next time. Next time, we are going to be discussing the 1982 Richard Attenborough biopic, Gandhi. Until then, James Corbett, CorbettReport.com. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's international forecaster editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com slash support.